Rambo, grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island, another true crime podcast, bringing you true crime from around the world. Well, we've had a few crazy cases lately. First, we had Steph- Stephen McDaniel Stork and then murder his neighbour, Lauren Giddings. Then last week, we had crazy cop Stephanie Lazarus Stork and kill her ex-friends with benefits, new wife, Sherry Rasmussen. And now this week, we have a very disturbing case of a cop who uses his position to not only stalk, but rape multiple women. Now, the references tonight are from Lansing State Journal, Detroit Free Press, The Daily Oklahoman, The Rock Island Argus, The Philadelphia Inquirer, HaltzClawTrial.com, JusticeForDanielHaltzClaw.com, Law.Justia.com, and K4.com. Okay, so this case is a little bit of a serial or making a murderer sort of thing, as there's a real split in the community on whether or not the accused was guilty, not guilty, or innocent. We know the difference between not guilty and innocent. Innocent means you didn't do it. Not guilty is basically we can't prove you did it, or not beyond a reasonable reasonable doubt. So just keep that in mind. Now, I'm talking about Daniel Holtzclaw, ex-cop, and now convicted rapist. Now, how about we start off by finding out who this Daniel Holtzclaw is, and then we can get into what he was accused of and subsequently found guilty of. So, Daniel Holtzclaw was born December the 10th, 1986, in Guam, to Eric and Kimiko Holtzclaw. Now, he has two sisters, Julie and Jennifer. Eric was in the Air Force, that's his dad, between 1976 and 1997. Now, he currently works as a cop at the Enid Police Department. Kamiko, apparently she was a cop, but now, according to fake book, she makes cakes for a living. Now, Guam is out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's out in the middle of nowhere, a tiny little speck. Now, Daniel grew up and went to Enid High School, where he graduated in 2005. He was pretty big, pretty big nuggety dude, you could say, standing at six foot one and around 246 pounds, or 125 kilos. Now, while in high school, Daniel earned himself a reputation as a footballer, playing in the position of linebacker. Now, for the rest of the world, a linebacker is like this thug that's going to go and chase you down and take you out, which he seems to like doing. Now, Holtzclaw was so good at footy that he earned a scholarship to Eastern Michigan University, where he graduated with a degree in criminal justice in 2010. Now, even though he played good footy at uni, he missed out on being drafted into the NFL. Now, this draft thing goes all day, and apparently he had a reporter in his house at the time because he was so sure of getting picked. Now, when he didn't get drafted... I don't know, this must have had some sort of effect on him. It probably affected him tremendously. I mean, he loved chasing guys and tackling them to the ground and and hugging them. And now, effectively, he couldn't play the game anymore. Not at least how he wanted to at a high level. So what other career can you get where you chase guys and tackle them to the ground? Well, I guess you can join the WWF or become a cop. And on the 16th of September 2011... Just like mum and dad, he joined the Oklahoma City Police Department. Now, Holtzclaw, he did pretty well as a cop, although from the looks of it, he was a little bit too eager sometimes, getting himself into a little bit of trouble. But we'll get to that later. In April of 2013, he completes his probationary period and is issued with a take-home cop car. It was a 2002 Crown Vic, and I can tell you something, I wouldn't mind having a 2002 Crown Vic. What an absolute amazing car. You've got some great cars there in in America, so I think if I came to live there, it would be a Mustang or a Crown Vic. 
Now, a couple of weeks later, Holtzclaw attends a call from a residence at 1421 Northwest 99 in Northwest Oklahoma City. Now, 38-year-old Clifton Armstrong was at his mum's place and he was acting delusional. His mum, Valencia, called police and at the same time, Clifton also called police. Now, he told them there were people in the house trying to kill him. Now, Clifton didn't live at his mum's house. He lived not far away, down the street or somewhere. So it was pretty obvious that Clifton was in distress and needed medical assistance. Assistance. In fact, he was probably in a meth-induced state of delusion, according to his mum, who said he didn't have any mental problems, just a drug problem. So when Holtzclaw and his police mates rock up, they try to calm things down and get Clifton in the patrol car. Now, Clifton ends up with no clothes on, and so the cops end up trying to restrain him. They put Clifton in handcuffs and used belts to restrain his leg movements. Now, this is what they call the maximum restraint hobble system, where you use a belt system that stops combative people from separating their legs so that they can't kick you or run. Now, then everything got quiet. Now, it got quiet because Clifton was dead. Clifton's grandma, Jean, she said he'd stopped struggling and the police told her they were handling it. Now, she also said, I don't know, I didn't know they were going to handle it to death. The officers involved were Holtzclaw, a Jeffrey Dutton, a Gregory Franklin and a Mohammed Tobiah. They would all be put on leave but cleared after an investigation and were back to work. Now, Daniel would find himself in a lot more trouble at work. Now, I don't have all the details here, but he was complained about dozens of times for being too eager to arrest citizens. Now, it looks like he just liked to tackle people because he just missed his footy, missed being a linebacker. Now, nothing would come of these complaints, and he was seen in the force as a really hard worker. Now, Holtzclaw was a churchgoer. He would regularly call his girlfriend up and recite Bible quotes to her. Now, I've selected a couple of Bible quotes. I'm just going to say them out, and I'm just going to see if they affect you in any certain way. So, first one we got here, Song of Songs 416. Awake, north wind, and come, south wind. Blow on my garden, that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. What do you reckon about that? There's another one, and it seems to the Song of Songs. <laughs> Seven, two to three. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin forms of a gazelle. And then there's Ezekiel. Okay, last one. There she laughed it after her lovers, whose genitals were like those of donkeys and whose emission was like that of horses. I'm not going to keep going with that one. That's too too graphic. Anyway, you get the idea. He was whispering these sweet nothings into his girlfriend's ear because he was full on. He was a Bible basher. Now, let's get back on track. Holtzclaw has been cleared of uh, these excessive policing incidents and cleared of the death of Clifton Armstrong. Now, that's probably maybe a little bit of smoke and you never know, we might get some fire. In December of 2013, Holtzclaw gets one of the new Ford Taurus police interceptor patrol cars. And if you've seen them, they look great. They're full black with the white lettering up the side. And it will be this car that gets he gets to take home at the end of his shift. Now, this time, Holtzclaw is working the Spring Lake District. Now, that's a section east of Oklahoma City, which in certain parts, especially a predominantly a black neighbourhood. Now, officers would work shifts, as you can imagine. Some are on during the day, some during the night. Now, during June of 2014, Holtzclaw is doing what could be called an afternoon or a night shift with his shift starting at 4 p.m. and finishing at 2 a.m. Now, in the early hours of the 18th of June, Holtzclaw had dropped into the Spring Lake Division OCPD, which is Oklahoma City Police Department, on North Prospect Avenue to sign off on his shift. Now, he gets in his patrol car and goes north on Prospect and then turns left into Northeast 50th Street. Now, it's at this time that he turns off his car computer, 
which is a violation of police uh, policy sorry, and procedures. Now, the computer controls Holt's Clause communications with dispatch. It allows him to run searches and powers his patrol car's AVL or automatic vehicle location system like GPS. Now, this isn't the first time he's done it. In fact, he does it all the time, and it's against policy. Now, if on his way home he needs to contact base for some emergency or he needs access to the computer, he can't, which puts not only his life at risk, it puts other officers and members of the public at risk as well. But on this night at around 2am, even though he wants to switch off his computers, and switch off his brain to policing, which you can sort of understand. I mean, it's 2 a.m. in the morning. You just want to turn this off, go home. Well, he sees a car swerve across lanes. Now, this car is a red 2005 Pontiac Grand Am, and it was driven by 57-year-old daycare provider and grandma, Jenny Ligons. She was going home after spending a night playing dominoes with friends. Now, as the lights turn green, the red Pontiac goes straight across Lincoln Boulevard and although Holtzclaw has to turn right to go home, he decides to go straight, put on his lights and pull Jenny over. Now, here's where it gets a bit crazy. Holtzclaw, with his hand on his gun, approaches the car and as the front door opens, Granny Jenny pokes her head out to tell this great big six foot one lump of an officer approaching her that her window won't go down. Now, she must have been terrified at this time of night, being pulled over and having a cop with his hand on his gun approaching her. Anyway, after about 15 minutes, the stop was over and both Holtzclaw and Jenny went their separate ways. The thing is, at 3.40am, it's just a couple of hours later, Jenny, with her daughter, granddaughter and her daughter's boyfriend, they end up stopping a patrol car in a parking lot and they frantically recount what happened during that stop when she was pulled over at 2am. Now, Jenny's daughter told the cops that her mother had been raped by a cop that pulled her over just up the road earlier that night. Well, while Holtzclaw is sliding into bed next to his girlfriend, all manner of a shitstorm is brewing, with Jenny being taken to where she said she was raped, and veteran sex crimes detective Kim Davis is woken from her slumber because she's on call that night. Now, Kim Davis tells officers to take Janny to the hospital and she'll meet them all there to take a statement. At the hospital, Janny's given a SANE test or a rape kit. Now, the SANE exam is a way to collect evidence that may be on your body from sexual assault. It's done at the hospital by a specially trained nurse called a SANE nurse. Now, Janny's statement, I'll read it out. I was going down 50th passing Kelly. I noticed car lights on the side of me. As he got a little closer, I noticed it was the police. He got behind me. As I passed the lights on Lincoln, he turned his lights on. I pulled over at the building by 50th and Lincoln. He stopped behind me, got out of his car and came to my car. My window wouldn't go down, so I had to open my door. He said, I see where you were swerving. Have you been drinking? I told him, no, sir, I don't drink. He told me to get out of my car. I was following him. He said, are you sure you haven't been drinking? I said, no, sir, I don't drink. He asked if there was alcohol in my cup in the car. I said, no, sir, it's Kool-Aid. He said, if it's alcohol, I'm going to arrest you. I said, you can taste it yourself. It's only Kool-Aid. Then he had me walk to his car, had me put my hands on his car, spread my legs and began searching me. He asked, Do you have any illegal drugs on you? I said, no, sir. He checked my pockets. He then told me to sit in his car. He opened the back door and I got in. Then he said, are you sure there isn't anything illegal in your car? Because if there is, I'm taking you to jail. I said, no, sir. He shut the car door. Then he went to my car, the driver's side. Then he looked for a minute. Then he came back and opened the door. He asked, How do I know you don't have anything in your bra? I told him I didn't. I asked if he wanted me to raise my shirt. He said yes. I raised my shirt up to my bra and he took his flashlight and shined it on my chest. He then took his hands to his private parts and started messing with it. I put my shirt down. 
Then he asked if anything was in my pants. He wanted me to pull my pants down. I told him I couldn't do that. I pulled my pants down to my knees. I kept my panties on. Then I put my pants back on. A car pulled into the parking lot, but then left. When the car left, he unzipped his pants and pulled his penis out. I was sitting in the car with my feet outside the car. He said, damn girl, you got a big booty. When his penis is out, I turned to the side. I said, please, you can't do this. I was afraid he was going to kill me. I looked and saw he was blonde headed. He said, come on, I don't have all night. I just got off work. I want to go home. I'm tired. Another car drive by, but it didn't stop. That's when he held his penis in his hand, and it was hard. He put his penis in my face. He said, come on, or I'll take you to jail. I leaned down and put his penis in my mouth, like a second. I thought he was going to shoot me. I was scared. I was frantic. I could see his gun on his side. Then he told me, come on, just a minute. Then I promise I'll let you go. So I put it in my mouth for 10 seconds. Then he moved back. Then I got up and went to my car. I kept saying, thank you, sir. I was begging for my life. When I got to my car, he said, I'm going to follow you to your daughter's house. I was in my car. He went so fast, he was gone. So then I got got my phone and drove to my daughter's house. So I'll add a little bit here or we'll be here all night. Now, Jenny had been at a friend's place earlier in the night. She smoked a couple of joints. Now, she, she was just playing dominoes. She did get a headache after that and had a couple of pills and a lie down, but she had to get the car back to her boyfriend as it, he needed it for work the next morning. That's why she was out at 2 a.m. Or she would have just slept over. Also, you may have noticed that she said he was blonde. Well, it was Holt's Claw, and apparently the lighting from some of the patrol cars or whatever under certain circumstances can make even black hair look blonde. So that's really nothing to pick at, and it was Holt's Claw. Okay, the next afternoon, Holt's Claw turns up for his normal shift, which starts at 4pm, and is immediately taken into a room by detectives Kim Davis and Rocky Gregory. Now, Rocky had been working on a case pre- before this, where a police officer had been accused of rape. And at this time, it was unknown who that police officer was. Okay, so Holtzclaw undergoes a two-hour interview. Now, you can watch this interview on my YouTube channel. I've put the whole thing up there. It's an hour, two hours or something. And I will also put a couple of other relevant videos to the case. So you can just go there and watch them yourself. You don't have to search YouTube for it. Okay, so I'm just going to put a little bit of audio from that interview. It's about 14 minutes long. It's Daniel, in his own words, saying what happened during that traffic stop. So you'll, if you want to skip it, come back at about 32 minutes in the podcast. You had said, and we told you that there was a traffic stop, that somebody made some allegations against an officer. They don't know the officer's name, none of that. But, and you said that you made a traffic stop after work, yeah. but you didn't call it in. I didn't call it in. Where was that? It was about northeast 50th and Lincoln just to the west. Okay. Tell me about that stop. I was going westbound on northeast 50th, probably a block just east of uh, Lincoln. I see a red Grand Prix, our Grand Am, in my right lane, and the outside lane. I'm in the inside lane. The car swerves. And so at the time I'm thinking, okay, it's probably a drunk person or maybe he got excited because they saw a cop. So I kind of fall behind it, kind of drifting just a little bit. Not crossing the lines, nothing crazy. So I light it up because it, at first the traffic violation I saw at first when it swerved. Um, that was just west of uh, Northeast 50th and Lincoln. And then made contact. It was a black female. Um, asked for license insurance. Um, Stated that she didn't have insurance, gave me an ID. At the time, I'm like, do you have a valid insurance or a valid license? She said, no. I told her, I just got off work. I mean, <laughs> what's the deal? You know, why, why are you swerving? And she says, um, I'm just trying to go home to Ann Arborish on the northwest side to see your daughter or something like that. Um, 
So I asked, is there anything on board as far as the vehicle? Is it okay if I search your vehicle and whatnot? She said, the only thing that's inside there is a Kool-Aid cup. I'm like, is there anything inside of that Kool-Aid? Is there liquor or anything inside of that Kool-Aid? She's no. I'm like, okay, is there anything else inside there? She says, there's pills. I'm like, is that the only thing? And then, so I said, can you have permission to search your car? She says, yes. I go inside the car, I see a lot of pills. But, um, what kind of pills? I didn't really like scattered pills or in a bottle. She said it was hydrocoding pills, but I just quickly glanced, looked at it, and I think I saw her name on the prescription bottle. So, oh, so it was a bottle, right? Uh, Okay, there were several bottles in her purse, and then so at that time, I just returned back to her. It's like, um, okay, I saw your pills, I didn't see any alcohol, I sniffed the drink, didn't smell any alcohol on the Kool Aid. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm just off work, I'm tired. Um, get your license taken care of. Just mine. So she didn't have a driver's license? She didn't have a driver's license, and I was just like, go to DPS, uh, Department of Public Safety on King, get that taken care of. I was cut her loose after that. Okay. Then where'd you go? That went straight home. Okay. Um, do you remember her name? It was on I the don't. I don't. Okay. Um, do you make traffic stops normally after work? I don't, but in that case, I... Solar swerve and whatnot, so I. I mean, me, yeah, I don't. Felt. Right <laughs> I know. I mean, people I know, kind of cops say that is right. have a you know whatnot <laughs> right. to have the vision, whatever. But I felt like I needed to make that traffic stop. Okay. How was she? Was she respectful? Was she? She not? felt like was she, she was nervous and whatnot, and I'm like, why are you nervous? And she was even crying. I'm like, why are you crying? Why are you nervous? Whatnot. And she's just like, I don't know. I'm just nervous because you're a cop and I got pulled over. I'm like, nothing you had to be nervous about. And I told her, I'm like, I don't really want to take you to jail for no SDL or anything. I just got off work. I'm tired. Mm-hmm. So, with my officer, um, courtesy or whatnot, I said, I'll go get that taken care of tomorrow. Let her on her way. And you don't have to, exp- I'm not going to sit here and go, why didn't you right. figure it out? Well, that's, that's the reason why. No, I don't care. Um, was she wrong? Did you think she was drunk? I think she was. I think she was. She drank, but I don't think she, with my experience, I don't think she was past the legal limit. Right. Right. So. So, I mean. And that's what I asked her, too, is like, with your pain medicines of hydrocoding, everyone knows that you drink with that and maximizes the effect. So, I asked her that. She said no. But I. When she was in the back of my car and when I was in the front car and the driver's seat, I could smell it off of her, but I don't think she was still past the legal limit. Okay. Okay. So you got her out of the car? Yes. Okay. Um, and put her in the back of your car? Yes. Okay. Um, any problems there? No, she was cooperative. Didn't give me any problems or whatnot. Okay. And then you searched, did you run her through Unit 800? I didn't. You didn't? Mm-hmm. So did you run her on your MDT? No, I didn't. All my, all my stuff as far as that... Cause I didn't even call it in and say it was a traffic stop. My computer was off and everything as well. Did you shut it off? I just shut it off. Work? Yeah, I'm way on 50th. I turned it off right before the traffic stop, basically. Okay. And where did you pick her up? 50th and what about? 50th and Lincoln, just to the west. But now, where'd you see her swerve, kind of? I said block just to the east of uh, Lincoln and 50th. Okay. She pull over right away. She was in the right lane and the outside lane when I saw her swerve. And so she saw a police car right there, and so she kind of did what everyone does, slow down, kind of, okay, is he going to pull me over or not? And then I lit her up about 50th and Lincoln, past the intersection to the west. Okay. When you um, when you put her in your car, did you pat search her? Uh, when I came around, I was like, lift up your shirt. Is there anything on you, anything as far as your waistband or anything like that? She said no. And then I put her in the vehicle and went from there. Did, her did your hands go on her? I when backhanded. I backhanded her on as far as the side. Where on her body? Tell me. You uh, backhanded her waist. Her waist and the back portion. I didn't touch her butt or anything, but the back portion and the waist. And then she lifted it up like right here. And there's nothing. Did she lift it up like this? No. Okay. So she never like went ooh, nothing no. like exposed her breasts no. or anything like that. She asked me if I was like, no, it's okay. She asked you if it, you want to search me. I'm like, no, it's okay. Uh, so she never like put her hands on the car and you. No, no. Okay. okay. Um, when you where was she positioned or standing when you back when you did your the it back was of your about hands on her? Probably the right 
front right fender of the of my patrol vehicle. But did you, was she facing you or was she turned? No, she was facing away from me. And you just kind of did it like yeah, this? Yeah, back then, yes. Okay. Did your hand go on her butt or No, anything? that's not what I'm saying. It was, it was the hip, the side, not the butt section. What about right here? No. You didn't? No, I didn't. Like a tuck gun and That's right why I asked to lift it up. Oh, so she just kind of showed yeah, you her belly? Right. Okay. Then you talked to her for a little bit. Right. In the well, you after you searched her, you right. put her in the back of the car, right? Then we used to always kind of keep the door open and talk when they're not like combative or anything. Did right. you talk to her and get information then while she was in the back of your car? Right. I talked to her for a little bit just as far as what's inside the vehicle. Can I consent to search your vehicle? Um, is there anything in that Kool Aid? She said no. Um, just talking to her, what's the deal? Why are you driving late at two o'clock at night? You know, why did you swerve? Um, so she's going to Ann Arbor over on the northwest side to visit her daughter, I believe. So. Then you went up and searched her car? After she gave me consent to search her car. How long, you think? I did a quick search, to be honest with you. I didn't, I looked under the seat, boom, sniffed the, sniffed the juice, whatever she's had, and I had small alcohol on it. Went through her purse, like she said, there's the pills in it, looked at it real quick to see if their name was there. And that was basically it. Okay. Then when you went back to her, mm -hmm. what happened? When I went back to her, I was like, okay, I didn't smell any alcohol on your, your car and your juice thing. And I'm like, what's the deal? Are you really drunk or not? And she's like, no, I'm just trying to go back home. And at that time, I was like, okay. But I'll go ahead and follow you. I said, I'm not going to take you to jail. I'm tired. I'm not going to take you to jail. I'll go and follow you. And let's go back to 44. And you head westbound on 44. So that's what we did. Did you follow her? Actually, she... When I went behind her and we got in the car, she took forever and I started getting annoyed. So I just do you turned it and I went ahead and I saw her in the back view of my rear view mirror. But she was following a 44, but then I took off going northbound on Broadway Extension while she took 44 to go west. So you were able to see her do that? Yes. And go. And then when you did you lose her when you got on Broadway? When I went to northbound on Broadway and she went 44 west. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, she's. It sounds like this is the lady, I mean, this is the deal where she's the complaining party. Okay. Okay. And she's making some sexual allegations, obviously, because sex crimes is working. Right. What she said? Well, was there anything, an accidental touch at anything? If she thought it, I, when I passed her, true, but I didn't, it was nothing as far as, I felt like I would do anything as far as sexual or anything like that. For my safety, I just checked to see if the weapons are anything. And, and I, to make clear, I didn't that. didn't touch her butt, but the waist side and whatnot. If you would like me to do, just for me to show you. <laughs> no, and I'm I'm fine with it. And you have every right to do that. Right. She's saying that you made her lift up her shirt, and she, and when she lifted up her shirt, she exposed her breasts. No, no. Did you ever? See I her asked her. Is there, I asked her. Is there anything inside your bra? And she said, no. So I was like, okay. And she said, you want me to show you? And that's all the time I said, no. No, you don't need to do that. She said that, she said, do you want, she said she was doing this. When you said, is there anything inside your bra? And she was going, no, I don't have anything like that. Did she do that? Yeah, she did, but I didn't look or anything like, like that. Right. And then she was like, do you want me to show you? I was like, no. She said when she said, do you want me to show you? You said, yeah. And she went, No, I didn't. But could she have been, woo Flashing you? And right. now you don't want to tell me because you're afraid you're going to get in trouble? No, no. When I told her no, I said no. Then she didn't go, yeah, no. you know, because sometimes drunk girls are... Having a good time. Yeah, right. and, and no. partying down. And let's face and it. I've already heard stories about officers people want, and whatnot. They and so want officers want, for hubbies want, so or I whatever. No. And, or, I said no. But you could have said no. But I'm asking you if she flashed you anyways. I didn't see her. I didn't, didn't see, see her no breast. Boobies? I didn't see her breast. Okay. What about pants? Nothing in her pants as far as I can see. She was wearing tight jeans. So. She said she pulled them down. Well, I didn't see it. You didn't see her pull them down? I didn't see her pulling down pants. Could she have done it when you were up searching the car? She could have. I didn't Did have she her, have them on? I when, didn't have her handcuffed or anything. When you came back to the car and got her out were her pants fastened were they yeah everything they was were still, up and everything was still intact so you never saw her pull her pants down no i didn't 
Why do you think she's making this up? I don't know. Did you write her a ticket? I didn't. I let her go. And I said, I said, I won't even arrest you for your no STL. Trying to figure out why she'd say that. I mean, I could see her saying it if you wrote her a ticket because she's pissed off. Right. Now, make it quite clear, if you saw her boobs, I don't care if she's flashing you. I did not see you her You did not breasts. see her boobies? No, I did not see her breasts. Is she saying you shined your light on her? I did not see her Where breasts. do you keep your flashlight? On the left side right here, right behind my radio. Did you have a flashlight out on the traffic stop? I did. When she was going like this, did you have your I flashlight on her? like that. But I, as I'm out on the radio like this, I have it right position over us but I didn't right I but did you have it on her when you're talking to her so you can see her Just I mean was it her. on her when she goes like this maybe she could right. construe to see, it to see her inside the vehicle was the dome light on the dome light was not on it doesn't come on I don't know how does that come on when you open your back door mm. it's been too long since I've been in a scout car I can't recall to be honest <laughs> I don't, I don't, th th I don't think the on? back I don't think it does oh. as far as the dome okay. light I'm just trying to figure out how long do you think you were on that traffic stop? I don't think it was an excess of over a, just a regular speed. 15 minutes at most, just like a regular traffic stop. Nothing as far as more. About 15 minutes. How long were you with her? How long of that 15 minutes do you think was searching her car? Where she's, maybe she's sitting in the back seat. Like I said, I had a quick search, probably at max, maybe a little bit over five minutes, maybe like five minutes if. So you're with her for 10 minutes? Talking to her, yes. Did it take a while to get her to consent to search or what? 10 minutes a long time? She was nervous and she was crying and stuff and I told her not to Did be she nervous. say why she's crying? She says, police officer and whatnot and I'm just nervous because I got stopped by a police officer so I'm like calm down everything's fine and then so I think maybe with the fact that she had no SDL maybe she was nervous as well too and then so I went to the search and it wasn't that it was a quick search like I said before it wasn't in detail pulling up carpet it was a quick search because you were just ready to go home I was ready to go home. did you go home and go straight to bed I went home straight to bed Okay, so in the interview, Holtzclaw denies everything. Look, he, he does confirm he turns off his computer and he confirms he did deal with Jenny, but he denies seeing her boobs, asking her to pull down her dax, and he denies forcing her to give him a blowjob. Now, he does agree that he smelled her breath for alcohol. He did check a cup with liquid in a car for alcohol as well. He said he checked her purse and saw a bottle of pills and he knew she had no license, but he says he just let her go. Now, all this took 15 minutes. Now, whether or not a stop like that, I'm not a cop. I don't make stops. Whether or not that takes 15 minutes, who knows? Now, during this interview, Kim and Rocky leave the room several times to check a little bit out on what Holtzclaws had to say. They even ring his 25-year-old cohabitating girlfriend, Kerry Hunt. Holtzclaw told Kim that he'd got home, he jumped into bed and had a bit of sex with his girlfriend. But Kerry, she ends up saying, no, he didn't. Now, Kim Davis takes this as a lie. And then from there, she thinks... That if he's willing to lie about something like that, then he'd be willing to lie about anything. A bit of a stretch, but then Kerry Hunt would later say that she was on sleeping pills. So did Kerry not know Holtzclaw was slipping it in when he got home? She was just too out of it to notice? I mean, I don't know. Throughout the interview, Holtzclaw looked reasonably calm. And now I think sometimes he looks just a little bit too calm. He's being accused of sexually assaulting not only Janny, but also other women brought up in the discussion. Now, I would expect a straight out angry, no, 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 like, why are you accusing me of this? I haven't done any of this sort of thing to some of these questions. Now, he seems quite wishy-washy in some of his answers. Then as Kim Davis goes back over the events of that night, and she does this a couple of times, as police do, Holtzclaw... I don't know, he seems to add more to his story each time, more small details. Now, I don't really want to read much into that, other than 
then he either he's trying to clarify everything that happened or he's just adjusting his story a little bit as he goes as a as a defensive measure now he could have called a lawyer and just kept his mouth shut now the problem with this is that it makes you look guilty i mean he was mirandaized so it wasn't like they were in there just for a happy little chat he does offer dna and a buckle swab is taken buckle buckle he does offer to undergo a polygraph, but I can't see any record of one being done. So he is cooperating with Kim Davis, who is leading the interview. Now, maybe he went through with this interview without a lawyer because he just thought like a lot of serial murderers, serial rapists, that he could easily defend himself with his version of events. He could get the interview over and done with and he would be believed more than his accusers. He just thought... He's the smartest person in the room. He doesn't want a lawyer getting in the way. Now, at the start, he is asked about a traffic stop. Then he is made aware of just one accusation. That's Jenny. But then when he's asked about another incident, did he think maybe I've sort of gone too far now to shut up and lawyer up? So he's walked in there. Yeah, yeah, you can tell me, ask me anything. I'll cooperate, blah, 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 thinking it's Okay, if it's this thing that happened last night, that's one thing. But all of a sudden there's more? That means they've looked into him a lot more. Maybe he should have just said, no, get me a lawyer, I'm not talking to you at all. Now, I've watched the full interview a couple of times. I still don't think he's 100% guilty or innocent. Holt's score to me comes across as a little bit cocky. He doesn't refute the claims made against him as you would think an innocent person would. He's not just saying, no, no, who's making all this shit up or anything. I feel he thinks he just has to say half of what went on, so he's got half truth there, dispute the rest under a he says, she says, and he's going to be fine. Now, let's not get too bogged down in this interview. At the end of the interview, Holtzclaw is put on administrative leave, he passes his badge, his gun, all that's taken off of him, and he's allowed to go home. His trousers are put in an evidence bag as well. And now they will get some DNA off that from one of his so-called accusers. But I'm really not going to go into all the details on every person who accused him. Now, he is being checked out. And what the investigators do is to start to cross-match a little bit of data. They see that Holtzclaw runs checks on women, multiple checks on women, for no apparent reason, as there's no ticket or whatever that goes with this check. They then contact some of these women and ask if they've ever had issues with any police. And a lot of them say that they've been sexually abused in some way, but they didn't want to report it because they didn't think anything would happen. Now, these women are some of the most vulnerable women out there, or vulnerable people, so to speak, out there. Some are in sex work. And look, this sex work, maybe that's a little bit of a sanitised version of what these ones are doing. These are... Generally, these ones are pimped out as prostitute, working the streets to keep the pimp in dollars and their drug habit supplied. Now, Kim Davis and her fellow investigators then cross-match when and where these women say they were attacked with the GPS or the AVL from Holtzclaw's patrol car, and they start to find matches. Now, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to go over every allegation tonight. There's just too many. Holtzclaw would be arrested on the 21st of August and charged with several accounts, all sexual offences, and put under a huge bond of $5 million. Now, that was later reduced to $500,000 and he was released from custody. But he broke the conditions of his bail and was ordered to spend 14 days in jail and his bond was increased by 109000 Now, one of the women that came forward, her name is Shadarian Hill. Shadarian Hill. Now, she told investigators how Holtzclaw arrested her for drug possession in 2013. She was taken to hospital with Holtzclaw handcuffed her to the hospital bed. He then forced her to give him oral sex. Now, spoiler alert, he would be found not guilty of this offence and other charges from accusations by Shadarian Hill. But not guilty doesn't mean innocent. And I'll get to that later, and I've already explained that. Investigators were able to establish an MO where Holtzclaw would conduct a traffic stop or stop the victims while they were walking. 
Now, while discussing the reason for the stop, he would ask whether the women had any drugs or anything on them. He would then demand that they show him their breasts or vaginas, often asking how he could be sure that the women weren't hiding something in their bra or pants or otherwise, referring to the demand as a search. With several victims, he touched their breasts or vaginas. He also demanded oral sex from some victims. Now, Holtz Claw's threats included taking each of the victims to jail or detox, threatening to arrest her, threatening to charge her with a crime, or promising that if she did as he demanded, he would make warrants or criminal charges go away or otherwise help her situation. Now, most of the victims had previous recent contacts with law enforcement. Some had outstanding warrants. Some had drug paraphernalia on them. Some were under the influence of drug or al- drugs or alcohol when stopped. Sometimes he offered the victims a ride. Most of the crimes occurred late at night or in the early morning hours. The women raged in <laughs> the women's ages ranged from 17 to their late 50s. On the 8th of January 2015, Holtzclaw is formally fired from the Oklahoma City PD. On the 27th of July, Holtzclaw went back inside for a couple of weeks when his ankle monitor ran out of battery. How's that then? Holtzclaw trial started on the 2nd of November 2015. He would end up facing 36 counts of sexual offences against 13 women. And the jury was made up of all white citizens. Now, Holtzclaw, he stayed silent and did not take the stand during the trial, which is fair enough. You know, you don't have to go there. They've got to prove you guilty. You don't have to go up there and say anything. Now, one of the witnesses, this is crazy, apparently made her testimony while off her face on PCP. The judge asked her to get a drug test and she came up positive with PCP. Now, with Holtzclaw not taking the stand, only the video interview he took with Kim Davis and Rocky Gregory, that was basically the only bit of testimony or the only thing that statement that the court heard from him. Throughout both cross-examinations and his closing arguments, the defence counsel attacked the victims, their families and their lifestyles. I guess that's their job. Defence counsel also vigorously argued that the victims had drug and legal problems and or felony convictions that showed they were deceitful and dishonest and that they should that should affect their credibility. So basically he's saying these are poor, vulnerable people with medical conditions, so everything they say are lies. That's just disgusting, but I guess it's his job. Now, he, <laughs> the defence counsel, he said, the witnesses that you saw in this courtroom don't care much about the truth. Now, the prosecutor responded in final closing that defence counsel didn't think jurors should care about the victims because they were lying felons with bad lifestyles. And this was Holtzclaw's attitude, that he believed he could do what he wanted to the victims because, given their past actions and lifestyles, he didn't care about them and no one else should. Okay, so the prosecution reckons Holtzclaw is targeting the most vulnerable women in the area. Some have drug issues, work the street, and generally, he Holtzclaw uses his position as a cop to get sexual favours from them, thinking that they're just not going to report him. And if they do, it just won't be believed. Now, the jury deliberated this for 45 hours over four days. So they didn't make a 15-minute thing of it. I guess they had a lot of charges, 36 counts to go over. So after the jury has deliberated, the judge would end up reading out the verdicts. Now, Holtzclaw, he was visibly shaken. When the first guilty verdict was read... He burst out crying. Now, as the verdicts were read out, and I will read them out in a second, he must have lost count of the number of years he was getting. I mean, I did as it was done. I've also uploaded this video to my YouTube channel if you want to watch it. Anyway, this is how the 36 charges involving, involving 13 victims pans out. So we've got the first victim. I'll do it in as victims for each count. So they're not all in order, but I'll say the count number. Tabitha Barnes, count one, sexual battery, eight years. Count three, burglary in the first degree. He was found not guilty. 
Count four, procuring lewd exhibition. Five years. I think that's asking for a flash. Count five, procuring lewd exhibition. Five years. Count six, stalking, not guilty. Then we've got Carla Raines. Count two, procuring lewd exhibition, not guilty. We then have Florine Mathis. That was count seven, sexual battery, not guilty. We then had Rosetta Gray. Count eight, forcible oral sodomy, 20 years. Count nine, rape in the first degree, not guilty. Sherry Ellis. She had count, uh, several counts. Count 10, forcible oral sodomy, 16 years. Count 11, rape in the first degree, 30 years. Count 33, sexual battery, 8 years. Count 34, sexual battery, 8 years. We then have Terry Morris, count 12, forcible oral sodomy, not guilty. Count 35, procuring lewd exhibition, not guilty. Count 36, procuring lewd exhibition, not guilty. We then have Carla Johnson, count 13, sexual battery, 8 years. Count 14, sexual battery, 8 years. Then we have Jenny Ligons. Count 15, procuring lewd exhibition, 5 years. Count 16, forcible oral sodomy, 16 years. We then have Carla Lyles. Count 17, 17, which was forcible oral sodomy, not guilty. Count 18, procuring lewd exhibition, not guilty. Count 19, procuring lewd exhibition, not guilty. Count 20, rape in the first degree, not guilty. Then we have Shadarian Hill, count 21, sexual battery, not guilty. Count 22, sexual battery, not guilty. Count 23, sexual battery, not guilty. Count 24, forcible oral sodomy, not guilty. Count 25, rape in the second degree, not guilty. Then we get to count 26 with her as well, sorry. Indecent exposure, not guilty. We have Sarita Bowen, count 27, forcible oral sodomy, you got 16 years. Count 28, rape in the first degree, 30 years. There's Regina Copeland, count 29, that's rape in the first degree, 30 years. We have Adaria Gardner, count 30, sexual battery, 8 years. Count 31, rape in the second degree, 12 years. Count 32, rape in the first degree, 30 years. So, eight of these 13 women, charges were proven. Now, you've probably lost count. That's a total of 263 years. Now, in Australia, it it tends to be a concurrent thing. So, the most he would have got on one count was 30 years, but probably with the rest of the the charges, the, the actual amount of the charges, probably would have got a lot more. But that's how we do it in Australia. Okay, so now there will be appeals and all of them will be dismissed. Now, part of the appeal, one of the appeals was that all these cases lumped in together, uh, they, they should have been tried separately. Now, I don't know that that would change anything. It might have even made it worse. I think defence thought if they split each victim into a separate trial, they could more easily show each witness to be unreliable. Whereas if, where all of them are put together, it sort of showed a pattern where, you know, could they all be lying? Now, the case that did trigger everything was Jenny Lyons. Now, she was just an older grandma. She wasn't like the rest of Holtz Claude's accusers. She wasn't drug dependent or working the streets. She had no motivation whatsoever to report him as Holtz Claude didn't write her a ticket. She had no warrants. She had no reason whatsoever or motivation to report him for touching her and putting his penis in his mouth. In fact, she knew she didn't have a driver's license. That means she had no insurance. He let her go with that. Why would you want to bring this up with the police and then put yourself, maybe you get booked for not having your driver's license? Why would she do that? She had zero motivation whatsoever to take this any further other than to go home. So when you look at her accusations and the accusations of the other women, it starts to look like a serial rapist is working the streets using his position as a cop to get away with it. In fact, 
It looks like he was starting to escalate his offending from the frequency of the encounters he had with these women. Now, I'm sure not all the women came forward either, so there could be more. Now, I'm not a fan of the you must believe the accuser, and a lot of crimes come down to he says, she says. So you would hate that someone would be convicted of crimes they didn't commit or got away with crimes they did commit. That's just the way it is. Now, Daniel Holt's call was given a trial. He had a lawyer and the jury found him guilty. He had appeals and they were dismissed. I mean, 263 years is ridiculous, but it is the way they calculate the sentences in Oklahoma, or they did in this case anyway. So, even if we take only Janny Ligon's case, forget about all the other accusations. Say she's the only reliable person because we think people who are very vulnerable at the bottom of the ladder might have some drug or legal problems. We will just say, we'll just cut those cases out. Holtz Claw still gets five years for procuring lewd exhibition. That's flash, getting it a flash. And 16 years for forcible oral sodomy. That's still 21 years. Now, if in these 21 years since his trial, so probably another 15, 16 years, he can prove he was stitched up on these other charges, okay, then let him out. So there's plenty of time, as far as I'm concerned, because I think, for sure, he was guilty of that. So, Islanders, I did a little poll on my Facebook for this case. It was, do you think he's guilty? Do you think he's innocent? And the last option was... Do you think he deserves a new trial? Now, every one of the respondents ticked the guilty, not even give him another trial. So, I mean, it's very small sample, but of the people who already knew about this case, all of them think he's guilty. Now, I wasn't on the duty, so what I think really doesn't matter. I brought you the facts as I saw them from newspaper articles, videos and court records. Do I 100% know exactly what happened with Holtzclaw and his accusers? What happened with the investigation and with the court system? No, I don't. Do I have an opinion on whether or not Holtzclaw is guilty or not? Yeah, yes, I do. Now, I sway to the side of the fence that he's guilty and he should be off the streets before he escalated his criminal action further. Just like I've mentioned before, Peter Dupass, who started out just raping, then escalated to murder. Now, my opinion on Michelle Malkin and how she is an advocate for getting Holtzclaw out of prison. You'll see plenty of that on YouTube. Well, I don't really trust her as an impartial journalist at all. I think she had an agenda here and was using Holtzclaw to give her own career a boost. But opinions are just like arseholes. We've all got one. Okay, Islanders, I have three videos on my YouTube channel, the companion to this case. Just search for True Crime Island. There's the original police interview. There's the Malkin interview with the detectives. So that's with Kim Davis and Rocky. There is the verdict being read out as well. Now, you you can just go and watch that and make your own mind up. And like, like Daniel used to say, you can't escape the Holtz Claw. Okay, so we've had a couple of road cop cases in a row. There you go. But that's all there is for tonight. Okay, I'd like to thank my patrons past and present for keeping the island lights on as it's nearly time to pay the bills, the hosting bill, which means we're coming up to five years on the island. Is it only five? It's five. Jesus Christ. Special thanks to Jason who's joined the island as well as Mel Holloway. And I'm not sure if Neil got into last... Neil Buchanan. Anyway, thank you so much. If you'd like to throw a dollar my way, please check out patreon.com forward slash true crime island. Really do appreciate it. Or if you just want to shout me a beer, you can donate to paypal.me forward slash true crime island. As Jess and Nico did last week. Jeez, I'm going to grab a beer soon. As soon as we're out of lockdown. My God, it's driving me mad. Okay, you can go to my website, truecrimeisland.com, where you can stream each episode if you don't want to use iTunes or any of those pod players out there. You can actually download it if you want to listen to it at work. I have links to merch, social media, all that sort of stuff on my webpage. Also, you can email if you want to get in touch. It is the best way to get in touch. I've had so many 
friend requests on Facebook lately. It's so hard to tell which ones are real, which ones aren't. You can tell the the ones that just want sex because you go to their page and it's all join my only fans or whatever, bloody bloody blah. But some people just don't. They're locked up so tight. I can't see a photo. I can't see anything. So, look, if I don't friend you, sorry, I just don't know what to do anymore. Well, that's about it. I've been your host, Cambo. You've been listening to True Crime Island. And as I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. Just don't forget that. Good night. Boom, bakalanga. Bye.